أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وآله الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد السلام عليكم everybody my dear brothers and sisters and welcome to another session of بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم on the topic of Shia Islam and the doctrines of Shia Islam. Um, as you all join and say salam, my salam is back to you guys. Wa alaikum salam everybody. And uh, it's good to see you online. Alright, so last week uh, we went through article number 42 if I'm not mistaken. Yes, 42. Which uh, got really um, specific regarding some of as sifat as salbiya, or one of the as sifat as salbiya, one of those uh, uh, attributes of God that are qualities that are negated qualities of God, meaning that God will not have them. So one of them was the visibility of God, God ha- being having the capacity to be seen by the physical eye. I don't know why Ayatollah Subhani necessarily wanted to. Talk about this one out of all the negated attributes of God that we have. And so the reason for that, not very clear to me. But at the end of the day, that's what he did. He broke it down and showed uh, how a quality, a negated quality of God will always go back to one of those deficiencies that one finds in someone. And since Allah is devoid of all of those, then He can't have these negated qualities. So He really, He really exhibited that for us when it came to through this uh, example of the visibility of God and God being visible. So He explained that when you want, when, if something is going to be visible and can be seen by the physical eye, what that will entail of problems, theological, philosophical problems. So there were three things that He mentioned. I'm not going to go back and uh, I'm not going to go over that again. But then after that he said, this does not mean that we can't see God with our hearts. He explained that as well. And then someone might say, but look, you have, um, we have verse, a verse in the Quran and maybe others also like this one that talk about how God is visible on the Day of Judgment. So he went through all of that. The, the famous verse that, وَجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ نَاظِرَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّهَا نَاظِرَ That um, on that day, on the Day of Judgment, that faces will be happy, and will be bright and glowing as if, and they will be looking to their Lord. He explains the tafsir of this verse. He goes in detail, brings proof and context clues uh, that no, what is meant here is not that they're going to see him with their physical eye on the day of judgment, but rather there's other another thing is meant here, which means that they will be awaiting and looking forward to the blessings of their Lord that will come to them. All of the explanation of that. And the reasons for that uh, covered were covered last week. So he wrapped it up, wrapped up this whole chapter of Sifat Salbiya, negated qualities of God. He wrapped it all up with one example. He went in depth in it, broke it down, and that was the visibility of God. God having that capacity to be seen um, uh, th- with the physical eye. All right, so now... We move on to today's uh, cha- today's uh, article, Article Forty Three. Article Forty Three says that uh, talks about a sifat al khabariya, sifat khabariya. Now, in this book, doctrine doctrines of Shia Islam, which is the translation of what I'm using, in this, unfortunately, I don't know. I disagree with. I don't like. You know, when it comes to translation. Uh, Every person will have their own opinion really But I I just can't wrap my head around this one Informative Khabari attributes Khabar of course we all all know Means news Means information Right So When he When Ayatollah Subhani has titled the chapter Sifat Khabari Qualities that are informative The problem is that Qualities aren't informative Qualities aren't teaching us anything. Qualities don't inform us of things. People inform us of things. Writings inform us of things. What is meant here, khabari, um, qualities, qualities that are khabari means qualities that have we have been informed of. 
that's what it seems that that's what seems to be the better translation so instead of informative uh, attributes I think it would be better if it would just you know informed attributes although that doesn't sound too nice either but what is meant is attributes that we've been informed of through what through the Quran or through our hadith okay so let me explain this now there are some qualities of God uh, that uh, uh, okay wa salam Imam Muhammad Bakr <laughs> one of our dear brothers is tuned in his name is uh, his Facebook profile name is Imam Muhammad Bakr so wa salam Imam Muhammad Bakr these qualities of God let me talk about this what is meant by them uh, what is going on here some qualities of God we would have never been able to come to and understand unless uh, understand that they existed except if God himself tells us or uses that wording okay that's um very important because some qualities of God we can arrive at using our own intellect using our own reason for example just like those previous ones we talked about like God and his visibility can God be visible or not no he cannot be visible he cannot be seen why just because the Quran said so no even if the Quran didn't tell us philosophically and theologically we could arrive at this conclusion that God cannot be seen because if he's going to be seen that means he has to be physical because our eyes are physical and since he has to be physical it means that he's going to have parts he's made of material material equals parts parts equals dependence on those parts and God is independent of all things so he can even God is not going to even be dependent on his own parts right so uh, some attributes of God we can arrive at using reasoning, using intellectual endeavor. But there are some that if God hadn't said it like that, we would have never thought of it. So he gives five examples here. As I said last week at the end of our session, you know, just when I was introducing this session, last week I said this. I said, I don't know why he has even opened up a chapter with this, with this title. Because when you look at the conventional uh, theology books of the Shia school, Usually you won't find this title, Sifat Khabariyah, uh, at, in, at, Informed Attributes. You know, you don't have this title. You don't have such a chapter. As far as I remember, at least in the conventional ones that we've studied back in the, in the seminaries. So I don't know why he brought it here. Personally, if you ask me, um, this kind of using the, I mean, based on the examples he gives, he gives five examples. Or excuse me, four examples. Yeah. And the four examples that he gives, four attributes that are informed attributes. These examples fall under the category of sifat salbiya at the end of the day, in my opinion. They fall under those negated attributes. Things that God cannot have. And since the Quran has used this wording, we have to figure out what is meant by them. So, he gives four examples. Number one. <clears throat> Yadullah, the hand of God. In the Ladina Yubayonak, in the Ma Yubayon Allah, Yadullah, Fauka Aidihim. Truly, those who swear allegiance unto thee, O Prophet, swear allegiance only unto God. The hand of God is above their hands. Surah Fat, verse 10. Okay. So. Uh, here, the Quran mentions God has a hand. So this is a sifat, a sifa khabariya, a attribute, an attribute of God that if the Quran had it said it, we wouldn't have known that. Oh, God has a hand. Of course, this has to be explained. So bear with me. All right, what else do we have? What other examples? It says wajhullah, the face of Allah. Oh, so Allah has a face. Apparently, He does. According to this verse, Surah Baqarah, verse one fifteen. I keep saying this. I'm going to have to explain each of these. But for now, I'm just saying it like this. That, oh, God has a face? Yeah, the Quran says, وَلِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِقُ وَالْمَغْرِبِ فَأَيْنَ مَا تُوَلُّوا فَتَمَّ وَجْهُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ وَاسِعٌ عَلِيمٌ Wherever you turn, to the east, to the west, oh, excuse me, uh, and belongs to Allah. To Allah belongs the east and the west. So, whichever way you turn, you will find Allah's face there. Verily, Allah is wasi'un. Alim. Number three, Ainullah, 
the eye of Allah. Allah has an eye who says, well, we have a verse in the Quran, it says, وَاسْنَعِ الْفُلْكَ بِأَعْيُنِنَا وَوَحْيِنَا Surah Hud, verse 37. When Allah is speaking to Prophet Nuh, and Prophet Nuh has to build that ark, Allah tells him to create, to, to build the ship under our eyes and by our inspiration. بِأَعْيُنِنَا Under our eyes. Okay, so Allah is one of these people. And these people have eyes apparently. بِأَعْيُنِنَا By our eyes. That's a question we have to answer. Number four example. Istiwa ala al-arsh. To sit on the throne. To settle on the throne. It says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-arsh istawa. Surah Taha verse 5. God settled or sat on the throne. The beneficent one. Who is established on the throne. This translation says. So until Subhani explains, he says the reason why, the reason for calling these attributes khabari is that it is only traditional transmitted knowledge that can provide us with information regarding these attributes. In other words, if we didn't have the Qur'an, if we didn't have hadith or whatever, if it was just us and our minds, we could never come to this conclusion that God might have a hand or an eye or a face and so on. But the Qur'an has used this wording. So these are sifat khabariya. These are attributes that have been informed. We have been informed of. But then he explains, and this is why I said that I think personally these attributes fall under the category of sifat salbiya, negated attributes. We don't have to open up a whole new chapter for them. You know, we could have just put them in um, the previous chapter, which was sifat salbiya, negated attributes. All right. So, what does he say here, Ayatollah Subhani? He says. It is important to remind ourselves that the intellect or human wisdom cannot interpret these attributes according to their conventional meanings. For this would lead to conceiving of God as embodied, tajseem, having a body. And therefore similar to us, tashbi, we're comparing him to us, to ourselves. Intellectual and transmitted knowledge alike like both ulum akli and ulum nakli, he means. They have both warned us against these misconceptions to think that God has a body or to compare Him with ourselves. Thus, we must keep firmly in mind all of the Quranic verses on this subject if we are to obtain a true explanation of these attributes. We must also remember that the Arabic language, like many others, is rich in metaphors and symbolic allusions, and the Holy Quran, which employs the language of the Arabs makes ample use of this mode of discourse. This having been understood, we can proceed with an explanation of these attributes. So see, he explains very clearly that look, when we look at these verses, it's not going to stop us from looking at other verses. Other verses are also explaining to us what is going on in these verses. When we put these puzzle pieces together, they, they come together to give us the bigger picture. If I'm going to judge, make a judgment, pass a judgment on Allah and His attributes, just based on the verse that says, Yadullah فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Allah's hand is over their hands. And, to, and I conclude, draw the conclusion that He has a hand then uh, that's a problem because there are other verses that negate such a thing from Him. So we have to put all of these uh, verses together. So then he starts, each of these four examples that he gave, he starts giving the expl explanation for each of each one of them and the, and the real interpretation and understanding one should have for each of these verses. Okay? So here we have a question by Brother. Could this kind of attribute possibly be referring to someone or something other than God? For example, could the hand of God be someone who acts physically on the behalf of God, like an angel, for example. And thus, hand of God could be a title or name for another being. Or face of God might be a way of saying a sign of God in the physical world. Very good. You can say that. You're going to have to have proof, textual proof, for this, um, if you're going to be postulating this. yeah. No one, no, one, no one can tell you that, no, this is wrong. Um, this is impossible. No, it's possible that the verses, when they use the word Yadullah, they might be referring to something else that might have a hand, right? Or someone else who is seen as the hand of God. But at the end of the day, the point is, the point is that what we have here, what we're sure we don't have is that God has a hand. That's what we're sure we don't have. 
And that's what he's trying to prove. Now you can interpret it in any way you would like. You just have to have proof for your interpretation, for your tafsir of these verses. So for example, if you're going to say, could the hand of God be someone who acts physically on the behalf of God? Very well. But you have to prove it <clears throat> that this is what is meant in this verse actually. It's a possibility to make it an actual reality and truth. You have to have proof for that. You get what I'm saying? So, um, but all that matters right now to Ayatollah Subhani is to disprove that God would actually have a hand. That's all he's after right now. All right, so it says, and, and of course he'll have his reasons, he'll bring his uh, proof for what his tafsir of the verses are, um, as you'll see. So the first one, for example, Yadullahi <clears throat> fawqa That Allah's hand is over their hand. Okay, what do you understand from this Ayatollah Subhani? He says, when Allah says, my hand is over their hand, it means, it's metaphorically saying that God's hand, God's power overpowers everyone else. Yes? <clears throat> Not that God is a material being and thus has a hand. What's your reason for it? You see, he has to bring reason, the reason for his claim right away. Just, and I've said this before, just because you're Ayatollah, um, doesn't mean you can't, you don't bring reasoning, especially in these discussions. In these discussions that are theological discussions, everyone has to bring their reasoning. When it comes to fiqhi um, discourse, yeah, if it's an advanced fiqhi class, they will also provide their reasoning there. The only time reasoning is not provided is when a person who is not, a mujtahid refers to a mujtahid and asks them what the ruling on something is. The mujtahid will give them their opinion without all of the extra um, reasoning behind that ruling because it will only confuse people more usually. It's a, it takes some expertise to understand that reasoning. But when it comes to these theological discussions or tafsiri discussions, we discuss. We discuss what the reasoning is for certain claims and certain understandings and interpretations of verses of the Qur'an. It's uh, kind of sad. Just today someone was telling me about some of the craziest tafsirs I've ever heard in my life regarding certain verses. Uh, so for example, someone today was telling me that there's this guy out there, not in, not in this part of the world, but back home somewhere, who I think is saying that Ayatul Tathir, the verse of Tathir, that إِنَّمَا يُرِيدُ اللَّهِ لِيُذْهِبَ عَنْكُمُ الرِّجْسِ وَيُطَهِرَكُمْ تَطْهِيرًا That Allah wants to do tathir of you people. What is meant by tathir is technology and progress, prog progression in technology and stuff. I was like, what in the world are you talking about? Where did that come from? So yeah, in this world and day and age of people just you know saying whatever they feel reads with their mindset and their perspective and outlook of, of life and this dunya and this universe, they'll say it. In this, in this day and age, we have to you know, ask sometimes, hey, uh, that sounds pretty nice, but what's your reasoning for it? Anyway, Ayatul Subhani is here, here. He says, look at, the, look at the continuation of the verse. The continuation of the verse shows what is meant here is what I, what I think it to be, not actual physical hand. Okay, before I actually get into his explanation, let me give you an example that will make it easier to understand how sometimes the continuation of a verse, the continuation of a statement and sentence, clarifies what is meant in the beginning of that sentence. So for example, if I say to you, yeah, today I saw, I, I, I met a lion. So right there you're like, okay, he met a lion, he saw a lion. <clears throat> but then I'm like, and this lion started speaking to me about all of the wars that and battles that he has participated in, and all of the uh, bad guys that he's he's killed and stuff like that. So from the continuation of my sentence, you find you what you're able to figure out is that when I said lion, I didn't mean lion in its literal sense. I meant lion figuratively. What I meant by lion was a very courageous person, for example. So lots of times we have this something we have some uh, figurative speech that is followed by clues that um, narrow down the scope of what we're trying to say to something specific, right? So now here he says, look at the continuation of the verse. The verse said that the people, when they are pledging their allegiance to the Prophet, they're pledging allegiance to Allah, Allah's hand is over their hand. 
That was what the verse was till here. But then the verse continues. فَمَنْ نَكَثَ فَإِنَّمَا يَنْكُثُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ So whoever breaks his oath, breaks it only to his own soul's detriment. You get it? They break it to their own detriment. So when you break your pledge, when you break your allegiance and bay'ah to the Prophet, you're actually only harming yourself. فَمَنْ نَكَّثَ فَإِنَّمَا يَنْكُثُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ While whoever keeps his covenant with God, on whom will he bestow an immense reward? So, But those who keep their allegiance to the Prophet, they, they swore their allegiance to the Prophet, they gave their bay'ah to the Prophet, and then they stayed firm and steadfast on this promise that they made. Allah is going to reward them greatly. So the continuation of the verse is saying these two. You either break your promise or you keep it. If you break it, you're in trouble. If you keep it, you'll be rewarded. <clears throat> he says this is the continuation of the verse. Yes? So I'll read off of what he says here to explain how he used the continuation of the verse to figure out what is meant by Yadullah فَوْقَ أَيْدِيهِمْ Allah's hand is over their hands. He says... The content of this discourse, namely threatening those who break their promise and giving glad tidings to those who keep their promise, he says the, the content of this discourse clearly reveals that the meaning of the hand of God is His power and authority. Why? Because if they are pledging allegiance, Allah is so strong that He can reward them later if He likes and He can punish them if, he, if they break their promise. Something like that. Also, in addition to all that, He says, the word hand appears in many dictionaries as a metaphor for power. And He gives an example in Farsi for that as well. So that was His reasoning. He says, look at the continuation of the verse. The continuation of the verse is talking about things that will require great power, either to reward people or to punish people. So, <clears throat> what is meant by hand here means the power of God. And that's one interpretation. Brothers and sisters, there's another tafsir for this verse as well. That when people give their bay'ah to the Holy Prophet, or you know, just usually when people are giving their allegiance to someone, it's, it's done through shaking of the hands or putting hands on each other, right? So when Allah in the Quran he says, my hand is over their hands, it's as if like, you know, they're putting their hands on each other on the hand of the Prophet to pledge their allegiance. And then Allah's hand is over their hand, meaning I am also with you all. I will be your support as well. So at the end of the day, whatever it's going to be, <clears throat> we know for a fact that God can't be material. God can't be material means he can't have a hand. If the Quran says he has a hand, it probably means something else. All right. Next um, example that he gave for sifat khabariya, uh, those informed attributes of God that the Quran has informed us of. Okay, so we have a question though. First, brother says those who take these verses literally are they outside of Islam? The answer is no, brother. They're not outside of Islam. Um, these are. This is scholarship. This is scholarship and interpreting verses of the Qur'an um, is something that us fallible beings have to try our best to get to the depths of. But not everyone is infallible and so not everyone's going to be right all the time. So some people will make mistakes. Some people will make mistakes in their tafsir and interpretation of these verses. Some people will be mistaken by just taking them literally altogether. Yeah? So it's just a mistake that they're making. It does, this does not take them out of the fold of Islam. I've, yeah, Unless a person interprets a verse of the Qur'an in a way that it goes against one of the usul al-din. So he says, like when, for example, if someone says, yeah, when Allah says, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Allah is one. What is meant by one here is um, uh, one of many, for example. Is one of a kind, while there are other gods that are also one of a kind. They're different gods. Like if they do a an interpretation of, that, of a verse like that, 
then they're outside of Islam. But not because they took a verse literally or not, or had a different interpretation of it or not. They just have a belief now that just doesn't read with the three usul al-din, which are Tawheed, Nubuwa, and Ma'ad. And of course, the Shia Madhab has its usul al-Madhab, which will add Adl and Imamah as well. So, no, no one, no one leaves the fold of Islam by having a, a literal understanding of these verses. All right, next, uh, next example that he has here. That's a good question, by the way. The next example we have here is that he gives for Sifat Khabariya, informed attributes, is Wajhullah. What was the verse? The verse said, Lillahi al Mashriq wal Maghrib. To Allah belongs the East and the West. Uh, whichever way you turn, Allah's face is there. In Allah Wasi'un Alim. Okay. What about this verse? This verse is speaking to us about it's speaking to us about one of the characteristics or attributes of God that we would have never guessed ourselves that God has a face. All right, what does that mean? Does that mean that he really has a physical face? Face means eyes, nose, mouth. What does it mean? So here once again, once again we are sure to have a face that means you have to have a physical body. So to have a physical body goes against the whole notion of God being God to begin with. So we have to reinterpret this verse. What does it mean then? He says, what is meant by the face of God means the essence of God. God himself. Right? The face of something, usually it represents the entirety of that thing. Right? If you take the face off of something, that thing's identity is gone. Think about it. If none of us had faces... Right? We wouldn't be that Id- easily identifiable anymore. Right now, what represents a person is their face. So face here, he says, means that that thing itself, Allah itself, himself, Allah's essence. Okay. Let me read off of what he says here. He says, the meaning of the face of God... Excuse me, here. It says, in the second verse quoted above, the meaning of the face of God is His essence. Why? It is not to be compared with the human face or any other creature's face. When the Quran speaks of the fana, annihilation, and non-existence of human beings, right? And not just human beings. Well, yeah, human beings, yeah. Kullu man alayha fan. When the Quran says everyone on the earth is will be annihilated, will be destroyed, will cease to exist. Kullu man alayha fan. Following this with an affirmative affirmation of the subsistence, baqa, and permanence of the being of God, there being no possibility of annihilation in regard to Him. So, man, I don't know, brothers and sisters, this English that has been used here is a little too hard to understand sometimes. I feel like it complicates things. Let me explain. So he says, look, we have a verse. We want. What do we want to do? What do we want to do? We want to understand what is meant by wajhullah in that verse that says, whichever way you turn, Wajhullah is going to be there. Okay, before you tell us how you get to your conclusion, Ayatollah Subhani, what is the conclusion that you're going to get to? He says, my conclusion is that face of God means God Himself. Okay, explain. He says, this is how it goes. He says, look, we have a verse in the Quran. It says, Kullu man alayha fan. Everyone on the face of the earth will perish and cease to exist. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ But the face of your Lord, yes, will will remain and will will continue to exist and will persist. Question. What does it mean that God's face will only remain? Brothers and sisters, this is important. God's face. If God actually had a face, and the verse is saying, these, these verses now are saying that God's face will exist, but everything else will die out. That kind of means that even God, some of God is going to die out. Only His face is going to remain. Yeah. So it's as if the verse is saying that God is going to die Himself, but His face is going to remain. What does that even mean? That goes against everything that, that, hold, that we hold for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for God. So it doesn't make sense to take wedge here to mean face. وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ rabbik. Everyone knows. What remains while everything else ceases to exist and perishes, what really will remain is God Himself. 
But the verse uses the wording face of God. So from here, we can easily tell, he says, face of God equals God himself. All right, take that wording and its translation slash interpretation, plug it into the verse that we were talking about before, right? Wherever you turn, the face of God is there. He says, we discussed face of God in those other verses. We came to the conclusion face of God equals God himself and the essence of God. Plug that into this verse that says wherever you turn, you find the face of Allah. What do you get as a result? Wherever you turn, God himself is there. God is there. Very simple. And it's trying to tell us that God, you know, there is no place that you can find that God won't be there. And then look what he says. I like this part. He says, look at the end, what the verse ends with. Inna Allaha wasi'un alim. That Allah is wasi' and alim, both. Wasi' means, something that is wasi' means that it's vast. It encompasses. Wasi' here means Allah is all-encompassing. Alim, all-knowing. So whether it has to do with concepts and theory, or it has to do with existence itself outside, all of this is encompassed by God, either His knowledge or His existence. Wasi'un alim. So He says, look, especially at the end of the verse, when it gives you these two attributes, these two attributes of God show and are hinting and are evidence that what was meant by wajhullah was God Himself. Because it is God Himself who is wasi'. It is God Himself who is alim. Yes. All right. So that's for wajhullah. Okay, let's move on. Aynullah. So as you can see, as I said before, these are all sifat salbiya. These are all negated attributes of God. I don't think Ayatollah Subhani needed to open up a new chapter for this personally. Very humbly, it seems. Um, maybe I should look at some of our conventional theology books and see if that's what they've done or not. Um, do they have a separate chapter for something like this? I highly doubt it. Aynullah. Okay, so Aynullah and the fourth is, is the third one. The fourth one is Arshullah, the throne of God and God sitting on it. Let's read through this real quickly. Um, it says in the third of the verses quoted above that, you know, when they told Prophet Nuh to build, when Allah tells Prophet Nuh to build his uh, ark with the eyes of, of God, bi'a'yunina, through the eyes of God, or with the eyes of God, or by the eyes of God. What does that mean? He says, in the third of the verses quoted above, Prophet Nuh is commanded to construct the ark. The building of such a vessel, far from the sea, led to Nuh being mocked by his ignorant folk. In such circumstances, it is as if God said to him, build the ark, you are under our supervision. Bi'a'yunina, true a'yun is the plural of ayn. Ayn means eye. But when he's when Allah says bi'a'yunina, with our eyes, what is meant here? Under our watch, under our supervision, he says. We have inspired you to do this. So the verse, that's how it should be translated, he says. Under our supervision. What is used to supervise usually the first um of the senses and but first of the body parts that is used when you are supervising somebody is the eyes you watch them so that's why Allah says through our eyes or under our eyes or under our supervision is meant here okay the, the meaning here is that Nuh was acting under divine guidance hence he would be protected by God so it either means supervision or it means protection of God even like God says look those people who are mocking you, don't worry about them. I'll protect you. Just do what you got to do. The meaning here is that Nuh was acting under divine guidance. Hence, he would be protected by God and would not be disturbed by the mockery to which he was being subjected. So I think that's a very simple, very straightforward, you know, easy answer that is given. And I think, I think we would all agree to that one. All right. Because God can't have eyes. We know that. Once again, physical physicality does not fly when it comes to God's existence. What's the last one? Arshullah. <clears throat> the throne of Allah. So it says, Ar-Rahmanu ala al arsh istawa. The Rahman, the Beneficent, is sitting on the throne. 
or establish himself on the throne. Okay, wait a minute, wait a minute. To sit on something <laughs> means that you have to have a body to sit on it. So throne, what does it mean here? Let's read. He says in the fourth verse, what that said, Ar-Rahmanu ala al-Arsh istawa, the word Arsh in Arabic means throne. And istawa, when used in conjunction with ala, because it says ala al-Arsh istawa, right? When used in conjunction with ala, means being established and having ascendancy over. Those in power normally... So here, Ayatollah Subhani wants to give his answer. He wants to say, look, sitting on the throne here has to do with authority. He says, Those in power normally dispose of the affairs of state when they are firmly established in the, st- in the seat of state authority. Hence, we can interpret this verse as a metaphor for the divine authority of God, which holds sway over the disposition of all things. Apart from the evidence given by the intellect and traditionally received sources, which alike affirm that God is not spatially restricted, one can uphold the validity of our metaphorical interpretation of God being established on the throne. So you see, he says, look, we have hadith, we have other verses of Quran, we have our philosophy and our mind and our intellect. Everything is telling us God cannot have a body. So if there is talk of any throne, you have to reinterpret it. You have no choice. And God is speaking metaphorically, just like everyone else who speaks metaphorically. For example, if someone does something for the 10th time when I've told them not to do it, I can either tell them I told you 10 times not to do it, but I will be meta- I will get meta- I will speak metaphorically. I will exaggerate in my speech just to get across my message very boldly. And I'll say I told you a million times not to do it. We speak like that. Allah speaks like that too because we speak like this. And this is how we get messages across. This is how we get concepts across. When I say I've told you a million times, that means I'm fed up to hear and I'm not going to say it anymore. But when I say I told you 10 times, what I can mean sometimes will be that, look, I've told you 10 times. It doesn't mean I'm not going to tell you for the 11th time. When I say a million times, that means, look, it's too much. It should stop. You see, these are things that come with metaphors that come with figurative speech, yeah, with exaggeration sometimes, not bad exaggeration, uh, reasonable exaggeration, of course, where, where it is due. This is how we speak to each other, communicate to each other. The Qur'an is no exception, right? So here when it says Allah is sitting on the throne, we know He can't sit on a throne, so we have no choice but to reinterpret the verse and take it away from its literal meaning, right? Because of this reasoning that we have to believe such, right? If there was nothing against God having a throne, we would take it literally. But we have everything that disproves the fact that God can have a throne. So we have no choice but to reinterpret. He says, my reason to say that it means to 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 sit in the seat of authority is that, look, this is the wording we use sometimes. Whenever in our lives someone wants to exert their authority, they'll sit in the seat of authority first. So for example, you won't go to a court and then the judge will sit on the ground somewhere. No, he will take his seat before he gives his verdict. And many other uh, similar scenarios like that. Because of all of this, he is convinced that if we're going to reinterpret the verse, we'll inter- reinterpret it in this way. And we'll say this is what is meant. Because it's the closest we can get to that type of wording. All right. He says, in addition to everything that we just said, there's two more textual proofs that I want to bring you. Number one, he says, this sentence, right, عَلَى الْعَرْشِ istawa, is not, it doesn't happen only once in the Qur'an. You have it several times in the Qur'an, right? He says, whenever you have this line in the Qur'an, it is preceded by verses that are speaking about the creation of the heavens and the earth and all of that, right? So when this, when you have this, and you have spoken about God creating, and then it says, then he sat on the throne, that means now he sat down. I mean, he says this is a good clue that now he's sitting down to govern that which he has created, right? So that's one context clue that he brings. Another clue that he also 
gives us, in addition to all that was said before, is that in a lot of these verses that speak, that have this line in it, that God sat on the throne, what they're followed, this line is followed by verses that speak about God and Him governing things actually. Right? So that shows that what was meant by the throne was Him actually now being in the position to govern, being in the position to run the show, yeah, and to manage things and the affairs of this universe, really. So if we ever have a verse in the Quran that is not followed by this, yeah, by this, um, by the verses that speak about managing the affairs of the universe, if we only have God sat on the throne, we'll know what is meant by sitting on the throne because there are other verses that have this line and an addition to them, to to it, to that line, an addition to that line, right? Since we were we were able to figure out with clues in those verses, then we know what this verse is also talking about that might not have anything after it regarding God governing. I hope it's clear. So that's why he says, the significance of the phrase established on the, fr- on the throne becomes clearer when we see that this verse comes between the theme of creation and on, on, on the one hand and that of governance on the other. The Quran wishes to remind us that the creation, this is very important by the way, The Qur'an wishes to remind us that the creation of the universe, despite its awesome dimensions, that's what it says here, (laughs) does not require us to exclude God from being in absolute control of its affairs after it's been created. This is very important, by the way. In philosophy and theology, this is super important to understand. When creation happens in its philosophical sense, not in its conventional sense, sense like a carpenter creates a table philosophically that's not called creating all right when creation happens takes place in its philosophical slash theological sense management governance of that creation is not separate from it the same one who created has to also govern it has to also manage it and run its affairs so that's what Ayatollah Subhani here is saying. He says, look, there's a lot of significance in this because it's reminding us that, look, creation and governance are not separate from each other. That is beautiful. Thank you, Ayatollah Subhani. And so he brings this verse to uh, put the cherry on the top, so to speak. That, إِنَّ رَبَّكُمُ اللَّهِ الَّذِي خَلَقَ السَّمَوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ فِي سِتَّةِ أَيَّامِ ثُمَّ اسْتَوَى عَلَى الْعَرْشِ يُدَبِّرُ الْأَمْرِ Verily, your Lord is God, who created the heaven and the earth in six days. Then he established, and of course, this six days, by the way, I've said this a million times. Some of you have heard this from me before. When it says six days, yes, yeah, sitat ayyam, the literal translation of it will be six days. But ulama have explained, it doesn't mean six 24-hour days necessarily. It can mean six cycles, six stages that had to be uh, traversed before the um, the creation was complete. So whatever that means, verily your Lord is God who created the heaven and the earth in six days, then he established himself upon the throne, and see what it what follows right after. Directing all things. He, estab- he, he established himself upon the throne. What was he doing? Directing all things. So establishment on the throne equals directing, governing, running all things. There is no intercessor intercessor with him except after his permission. All right. Alhamdulillah, we, we were able to... Uh, <laughs> that's funny. It's 7.43 right now and we just finished uh, article number 43. So article 43 took 43 minutes to finish. Alhamdulillah. I think that's a sign that we should end it here inshallah. So, we have coming up three... Things that, and I'm not gonna, I'm just introducing this. We're done with today's lesson. Um, there are three things that Ayatullah Subhani now brings after he's done with this. Okay, brothers and sisters. Number one, he talks about um, the justice of God. He has isolated this quality of God for a reason. One. Two, he talks about Qada and Qadar which is divine decree and measurement, which we also need to talk about. And there are some misunderstandings there as well. And then he talks about ikhtiyar and the free will of mankind. 
These three he talks about. So we're done with God. Right now, as a matter of fact, we kind of ended the discussion of Tawheed and God. There are three things that three things that if we don't solve, it'll cause problems for our understanding of God. One is divine decree, one is justice of God, and one is our free will. So we need to talk about that, okay? So uh, those three are what we have coming up. It's going to take a while to go through those, but once those three are done, we're done with Tawheed altogether, and we're going to move into Nubuwa and Prophethood, inshallah ta'ala. Thanks for tuning in. Keep us in your du'as. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.